Markets Freed from Capitalism. Charles W. Johnson, 2010. Let's talk about the structure and mechanisms of state capitalism. I mean how, in everyday economic life, the political structure of corporate privilege tends to produce and sustain the material conditions of the boss's economy. How, to use Gary Chartier's threefold distinction, capitalism, two promotes capitalism, three, and how freed markets would abolish the one and run the other into the ground. Footnote. Gary Chartier, Advocates of Free Markets Should Oppose Capitalism, Chapter 9, pages 107 to 117, in this book. Most of my remarks here will be broadly historical and economic in character, although necessarily of a sketchy or programmatic sort, given the size of the topic and the constraints of the space. So consider this a guide to directions for inquiry and discussion, an attempt to show you briefly where key landmarks of the free market anti-capitalist analysis are at, rather than an attempt at a full guided tour. I think it is important to at least sketch out the map because the chief obstacle that free market anti-capitalists confront in explaining our position is not so much a matter of correcting particular mistakes in political principles or economic analysis, although there are particular mistakes we hope to address and correct. It is more a matter of convincing our conversation partners to make a sort of aspect shift, to adopt a new point of view from which to see the political economic gestalt. The need for this shift is pressing because, with apologies to Shulamith Firestone, the political economy of state capitalism is so deep as to be invisible. Footnote. See Shulamith Firestone, The Dialectic of Sex, The Case for Feminist Revolution. New York, Farrar, 2003. Or it may appear to be a superficial set of interventions, a problem that can be solved by a few legal reforms, or perhaps the elimination of bailouts and the occasional export subsidy, while preserving more or less intact the basic recognizable patterns of capitalistic business as usual. The free market anti-capitalist holds there is something deeper and more pervasive at stake than the sort of surface-level policy debates to which pro-capitalist libertarians too often limit their discussions. A fully freed market means the liberation of vital command posts in the economy, reclaiming them from points of state control to nexuses of market and social entrepreneurship, transformations from which a market would emerge that would look profoundly different from anything we have now. That so profound a change cannot easily fit into traditional categories of thought, for example, libertarian or left-wing, laissez-faire or socialist, entrepreneurial or anti-capitalist, is not because these categories do not apply, but because they are not big enough. Radically free markets burst through them. If there were another word more all-embracing than revolutionary, we would use it. Two meanings of markets. In order to get clear on the topic in a conversation about free market anti-capitalism, the obvious points where clarification may be needed are going to be the meaning of capitalism, the meaning of markets, and the meaning of freedom in the market context. Left libertarians and market anarchists have spent a lot of time and raised a lot of controversy talking about the first topic, whether capitalism is really a good name for the sort of thing that we want, the importance of distinguishing markets from actually existing capitalism, and the possibility of disentangling multiple senses of capitalism. There's been a lot of argument about that, but for the moment, I would like to pass that question by in order to focus on the less frequently discussed side of our distinction not the meaning of capitalism, but the different strands of meaning within the term market. The meaning of the term is obviously central to any free market economics, but I would argue that there are at least two distinct senses in which the term is commonly used. Markets as free exchange. When libertarians talk about markets, or especially the market, singular, We often mean to pick out the sum of all voluntary exchanges, any economic order based, to the extent that it is based, on principles of personal ownership of property, consensual exchange, free association, and the freedom to engage in peaceful competition and entrepreneurial discovery. Footnote. Pro-capitalist economists have often suggested such a broad understanding of markets, even if they have not fully understood or were not willing to fully draw out its implications. For example, Murray Rothbard, Toward a Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics, Ludwig von Mises Institute, 2002, writes that the free market is the name for the array of all voluntary exchanges that take place in the world, 
Ludwig von Mises, Human Action, a Treatise on Economic Principles, Scholar's Edition, Auburn, Alabama, Mises, 1998, writes that there is in the operation of the market no compulsion and coercion. Each man, sick, is free. Nobody is subject to a despot. Of his, sick, own accord, the individual integrates himself, sick, into the cooperative system. The market is not a place, a thing, or a collective entity. The market is a process, actuated by the interplay of the actions of the various individuals cooperating under the division of labor. Page 158. Markets as the cash nexus. But we often also use the term in a different sense, to refer to a particular form of acquiring and exchanging property, that is, to refer to commerce and quid pro quo exchanges, relatively impersonal social relationships on a paying basis, typically mediated by currency or by financial instruments denominated in units of currency. These two senses are interrelated. When they take place within the context of a system of free exchange, the social relationships based on the cash nexus, producing, buying, and selling at market prices, saving money for future use, investing money in productive enterprises, and the like, have all positive, even essential, roles in a flourishing free society. I do not intend to argue that these will disappear in a society of equal freedom, but I do intend to argue that they may not look like what you expect them to look like if your picture of commercial relationships is taken from commerce under the conditions of corporate capitalism. Commerce under capitalism does have many of the exploitative and alienating features that critics on the left accuse private enterprise or market society of having, but not because of the enterprise or because of the market. The problem with commerce under capitalism is capitalism, and without it, both freed market exchange and cash nexus commerce will take on a wholly different character. To see how they might come together, we must first attend to how they come apart. However often they may be linked in fact, free exchange and the cash nexus are distinguishable in concept. Markets in the first sense, the sum of all voluntary exchanges, include the cash nexus, but also much more than the cash nexus. If a freed market is the sum of all voluntary exchanges, then family sharing takes place within a freed market, charity is part of a freed market, gifts are part of a freed market, informal exchange and barter are all part of a freed market. Similarly, while markets as free exchange may include capitalistic arrangements, so long as they are consensual, they also encompass far more than that. There is nothing in a freed market that prohibits wage labor, rent, corporate jobs, or corporate insurance. But a freed market also encompasses alternative arrangements, including many that clearly have nothing to do with employer-employee relationships or corporate management, and which fit awkwardly at best with any conventional meaning of the term capitalism. Worker ownership and consumer co-ops are part of the market. Grassroots mutual aid associations and community free clinics are part of the market. So are voluntary labor unions, consensual communes, narrower or broader experiments with gift economies, and countless other alternatives to the prevailing corporate capitalist status quo. To focus on the specific act of exchange may even be a bit misleading. It might be more suggestive and less misleading to describe a fully freed market in this sense as the space of maximal consensually sustained social experimentation. The question, then, is whether, when people are free to experiment with any and every peaceful means of making a living, the sort of mutualistic alternatives that I've mentioned might take on an increased role in the economy, or whether the prevailing capitalistic forms would continue to predominate as they currently do. To be sure, the capitalistic arrangements predominate now. Most of the viable ways to make a living are capitalist jobs. Most people either rent their home from a landlord or own it only so long as they keep up with monthly bills to a bank. Large centralized management predominates in companies, and corporations predominate in providing credit, insurance, health care, and virtually all capital and consumer goods. Productive enterprises are almost all commercial enterprises. Commercial enterprises are predominantly large-scale, centralized corporate enterprises, and corporate enterprises are controlled by a select, relatively small, socially privileged class of managers and financiers. Inequalities in wealth and income are vast, and the vast inequalities have profound social effects. But of course, the fact that capitalistic arrangements predominate now is no reason to conclude that the market has spoken, 
or that capitalistic concentrations of wealth are a basic tendency of free market exchange. It might be a reason to think that if the predominance of capitalistic arrangements were the product of revealed preferences in a free market, but since we don't at present have a free market, it will at the very least take some further investigation in order to determine whether these capitalistic alternatives prevail in spite of the unfreedom of actually existing markets, or if they prevail in part because of that unfreedom. First, let us take this lesson and apply it to the market as cash nexus. The cash nexus does not exhaust the forms of voluntary exchange and economic experimentation that might emerge within a freed market. But more than that, a cash nexus may exist, and may be expansive and important to economic life, whether or not it operates under conditions of genuine individual freedom. Markets, in our first voluntary exchange sense, exist where people really are free to produce and exchange. Free market in the voluntary exchange sense of market is really a tautology, and where there is no free exchange, there is no market order. But a market in the cash nexus sense may be either free or unfree. Cash exchanges are still cash exchanges whether they are regulated, restricted, subsidized, taxed, mandated, or otherwise constrained by government action. Any discussion of the cash nexus in the real world, or the everyday market institutions, economic relationships, and financial arrangements that we have to deal with in this governmental economy, needs to take account not only of the ways in which government limits or prohibits market activity, but also the ways in which government, rather than erasing markets, creates new rigged markets, points of exchange, cash nexuses which would be smaller, or less important, or radically different in character, or simply would not exist at all but for the intervention of the state. Libertarians often speak of market exchange and government allocation as cleanly separate spheres, as if they were two balloons set one next to the other in a closed box, so that when you blow one of them up the other has to shrink to the same extent. That's true enough about markets as social experimentation. To the extent you put in political processes, you take out voluntary relationships. But the relationship between cash nexus exchange and government allocation is really more like two plants growing next to each other. When one gets bigger, it may overshadow the other and stunt its growth. But they also climb each other, shape each other, and may even cause some parts of the other plant to grow far more than if they had not had the support. Market anarchists must be clear when we speak about the growth of markets and their role in social life, whether we are referring to markets as free exchange or markets as a cash nexus. Both have a valuable role to play, but the kind of value they offer and the conditions and context within which they have that value depends on what we mean. For a principled anti-statist, the growth of markets as spaces for consensual social experimentation is always a liberating development. But these social experiments may be mediated by the cash nexus, or may be mediated by entirely different social relationships, and may look nothing like conventional business or commerce. The growth of markets as cash nexus exchanges, on the other hand, may be liberating or violating, and its value must depend entirely on the context within which it arises. Whether those relationships come about through the free interplay of social forces, or through the direct or indirect ripple effects of government force and coercive creation of rigged markets. Forms of interaction that are positive and productive in the context of free exchange easily become instruments of alienation and exploitation when coercive government forces them on unwilling participants or shoves them into areas of our lives where we don't need or want them. Rigged Markets, Captive Markets, and Capitalistic Business as Usual when market anarchists carefully distinguish the broad meaning of markets as voluntary social experimentation and the narrow meaning and connotations of markets as the cash nexus, this underlines the need to look not only at the ways in which voluntary exchange may be confined or erased, but also the ways in which cash exchange and the sorts of human relationships and social mediation that go along with it may be locked out or locked in, held back from people or foisted on them. For anti-capitalist market anarchists, there are at least three specific mechanisms we might mention that shove people into rigged markets, mechanisms that are especially pervasive and especially important to the overall structure of actually existing markets, mechanisms by which incumbent big businesses and capitalistic arrangements broadly benefit from rigged markets at the expense of workers, consumers, taxpayers, and mutualistic alternatives to the statist quo. These three are 
1. Government monopolies and cartels, in which government penalties directly suppress competition or erect effective barriers to entry against newcomers or substitute goods and services. 2. Regressive redistribution, in which property is directly seized from ordinary workers by government expropriation and transferred to economically powerful beneficiaries in the form of tax-funded subsidies and corporate welfare, taxpayer-backed sweetheart loans, the widespread use of eminent domain to seize property from small owners and transfer it to big commercial developers, etc. Footnote. For the most famous recent case of such eminent domain abuse, see Kilo v. New London, 545 U.S. 469, 2005. City government used eminent domain to condemn and seize the houses of Suzette Kilo and many other small homeowners in New London, Connecticut, to hand the real estate over to a wealthy private developer. The developer intended to bulldoze the houses and replace them with developments for his own profit and for the benefit of the Fortune 500 drug company Pfizer, Inc., the court-backed city government, holding they could take any home and transfer it to any private party so long as a government-sponsored economic development plan indicated that it would increase government's tax revenues. Kilo drew widespread attention to the issue, but similar seizures and transfers, mostly targeted against the neighborhoods of racial minorities, immigrants, and the urban poor, had been widely practiced for decades under the heading of urban renewal. Compare Mindy Fullilove, Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What We Can Do About It, New York, Random 2005, and Dick M. Carpenter and John K. Ross, Victimizing the Vulnerable, The Demographics of Eminent Domain Abuse, Arlington, Virginia, Institute for Justice, 2007. And three, Captive Markets in which demand for a good is created or artificially ratcheted up by government coercion, which can mean a direct mandate with penalties inflicted on those who do not buy in, or a situation in which market actors are driven into a market on artificially disadvantageous terms as an indirect, perhaps even unintended, ripple effect of prior government interventions. As an easy example of a directly imposed captive market, consider the demand for corporate car insurance. When state governments mandate that every driver is to purchase and maintain car insurance from bureaucratically approved insurance companies, they necessarily shrink the scope of voluntary exchange, but they also dramatically bulk up a particular fetishized form of cash exchange by creating a new bill that everyone is forced to pay and a select class of incumbent companies with easy access to a steady stream of customers, many of whom might not pay for their services but for the threat of fines and arrest. The space of social experimentation contracts, but the cash nexus fattens on what government has killed. As an example of an indirectly imposed captive market, consider the demand for professionally certified accountants. CPAs perform a useful service, but it's a service that far fewer people, and indeed far fewer businesses, would need, except for the fact that they need help coping with the documentation and paperwork requirements that government tax codes impose. A CPA is essentially someone trained in dealing with financial complexity. But finances are much more complex than they would be in a free society precisely because of government taxation and the bizarre requirements and perverse incentives that tend to make things much more complex than they otherwise would be. Although government has no special interest in benefiting the bottom line of CPAs, it is nevertheless the case that CPAs are able to get far more business and at a far higher rate than they would in a market without income tax, payroll tax, capital gains tax, property tax, sales tax, use tax, and the myriad other taxes that demand specialized expertise in accounting and interpretation of legal requirements. With these three mechanisms in sight, a quick way to gloss the free market anti-capitalist thesis is this. We hold that many of the recognizable patterns of capitalist economics result from the fact that certain key markets, importantly the labor market, housing rental market, insurance and financial markets, and other key markets, are rigged markets, and in particular that they are often indirectly created captive markets, and that the extent to which these needs are met through conventionally commercial relationships under the heading of the cash nexus, rather than being met through other possibly radically different sorts of social relationships, like co-ops, homesteading, sweat equity, informal exchange, loosely reciprocal gift economies, grassroots mutual aid networks, and other mutualistic alternatives, has little to do with people's underlying desires or preferences, 
and a great deal to do with the constraints placed on the expression of those desires or preferences. Commercial relationships and the cash nexus grow fat because working class folks in need of houses or jobs are driven into a market where they are systematically stripped of resources and alternatives, where they are constantly faced by artificially high costs, and where they are generally constrained to negotiate with incumbent market players who have been placed in an artificially advantageous position over them through continuous, repeated, and pervasive government interventions in the incumbent's favor. Footnote. See also Charles W. Johnson, Scratching By, How Government Creates Poverty as We Know It. The Freeman, Ideas on Liberty, 57.10, December 2007, pages 33-38. to Foundation for Economic Education, 2007. Tucker's Big Four and the Many Monopolies It may be unusual for claims like this to be associated with advocates for market freedom. Free market economics is generally assumed to be the province of pro-business politicians and the economic right. It is usually state liberals, progressives, social democrats, and economic radicals who are expected to argue that people in their roles as workers, tenants, or consumers are shoved into alienating relationships and exploitative transactions, that they are systematically deprived of more humane alternatives, and suffer because they are left to bargain at a tremendous disadvantage with bosses, banks, landlords, and big faceless corporations. But while I agree that this is a radical, indeed socialistic, position, I deny that there is anything reactionary, right-wing, or pro-business about the ideal of freed markets. Indeed, it is freed market relationships which provide the most incisive, vibrant, and fruitful basis for socialistic ideals of economic justice, worker emancipation, and grassroots solidarity. Anti-capitalist claims like the ones I have just made may be rarely heard among vulgar, free enterprise apologists now, but they are hardly unusual in the long view of libertarian history. Before the mid-twentieth century, when American libertarians entangled themselves in conservative coalitions against the New Deal and Soviet communism, free market thinkers largely saw themselves as liberals or radicals, not as conservatives. Libertarian writers, from Smith to Bastiat to Spencer, had little interest in tailoring their politics to conservative or pro-business measurements. They frequently identified capitalists and their protectionist policies as among the most dangerous enemies of free exchange and property rights. The most radical among them were the mutualists and individualist anarchists, among them Benjamin Tucker, Dyer Lum, Victor Yaros, and Voltaire de Clare. Tucker, the individualist editor of Liberty, wrote in 1888, that his anarchism called for absolute free trade, laissez-faire the universal rule. But all the while he described this doctrine of complete laissez-faire and free competition a form of anarchistic socialism. Footnote. Benjamin R. Tucker. State Socialism and Anarchism. How Far They Agree and Herein They Differ. Chapter 2, pages 21 to 35 of this book. For Tucker, of course, Socialism could not mean government ownership of the means of production. That was state socialism, which Tucker opposed root and branch. What he meant, rather, was workers' control over the conditions of their labor. Opposition to actually existing economic inequalities, capitalist labor relations, and the exploitative practices of big business supported by state privilege. For Tucker, the surest way to dismantle capitalist privilege was to knock through the political privileges which shield it, and to expose it, unprotected, to the full range of competing enterprises, including mutualistic enterprise of, for, and by freed workers that genuinely freed exchange would allow. In order to make clear what those privileges were, and how they rigged markets in favor of capitalistic big business, Tucker identified and analyzed four great areas where government intervention artificially created or encouraged class monopolies, concentrating wealth and access to factors of production into the hands of a politically select class insulated from competition and prohibiting workers from organizing mutualistic alternatives. The big four monopolies Tucker identified as central to the Gilded Age economy were Footnote Tucker, 1888 For a contemporary discussion, See also Part 2 of Kevin Carson's Studies in Mutualist Political Economy, Charleston, South Carolina, Book Surge, 2007. 1. The Land Monopoly, 
government concentration of ownership of land and natural resources through the enforcement of legally fabricated land titles, such as preferential land grants to politically connected speculators or literally feudal land claims in Europe. Since Tucker, the land monopoly, already key to the Gilded Age economy, has rapidly expanded, with the frequent nationalization of mineral and fossil fuel resources throughout, and the emergence of local zoning codes, complex housing construction codes, land use restrictions, urban renewal, for-profit eminent domain and municipal development rackets, and a host of local policies intended to keep real estate prices high and permanently rising. In a freed market, land ownership would be based entirely on labor-based homesteading and consensual transfer, rather than on military conquest, titles of nobility, sweetheart development deals, or eminent domain seizures, and land would tend, ceteris paribus, to be more widely distributed, with more small individual ownership, dramatically less expensive, with more ownership free and clear, and could as easily be based on sweat equity and the homesteading of unused land without the need for any commercial cash exchange. Footnote. See also Charles Johnson Scratching By, Chapter 41, pages 377 to 384 in this volume, along with Charles Johnson, Urban Homesteading, Rad Geek People's Daily, and Charles Johnson, Enclosure Comes to Los Angeles, both available on radgeek.com. 2. The Money Monopoly. Government Control Over the Money Supply, Artificially Limiting the Amount of Money and Credit to a Government-Approved Banking Cartel. Tucker saw this not only as a source of monopoly profits for the incumbent banks, but also the source of the concentration of capital, and hence economic ownership, in the hands of a select business class. Credit and access to capital were artificially restricted to those large established businesses which the large established banks preferred to deal with, while government imposed specie requirements, capitalization requirements, and penalties on the circulation of alternative currencies, suppressed competition from mutual credit associations, labor notes, land banks, and other means by which workers might be able to pool their own resources and access credit on more advantageous terms than those offered by commercial banks. Tucker, in 1888, was writing about the money monopoly before the Federal Reserve or the conversion to a pure fiat currency, before the SEC, FDIC, TARP, Fannie, Freddie, IMF, World Bank, banking holidays, bailouts, too big to fail, and the myriad other means by which government has insulated big bankers and financiers from market consequences, often at direct taxpayer expense, and erected regulatory barriers to entry which insulate politically approved business models from market competition. Perhaps just as importantly, in light of recent political debates, is the extent to which regulation and industry cartelization has also turned insurance, as well as credit, savings, and investment, into a new arm of the money monopoly, with government-rigged markets directly mandating the purchase of corporate car insurance and corporate health insurance, and crowding out or shutting down the non-corporate, grassroots forms of mutual aid that could provide alternative means for securing against catastrophic expenses. 3. The Patent Monopoly Government Grants of Monopoly Privileges to Patent Holders and Copyright Holders Tucker argued that patents and copyrights did not represent a legitimate private property claim for their holders, since it did not protect any tangible property that the patent holder could be deprived of, but rather prohibited other market actors from peacefully using their own tangible property to offer a good or service that imitated or duplicated the product being offered by the holder of the so-called intellectual property. These prohibitions, enforced with the explicit purpose of suppressing market competition and ratcheting up prices in order to secure a long period of monopoly profits for the IP holder, have only dramatically escalated since Tucker's day, as the growth in the media industry, the technology industry, and scientific innovation have made politically granted control over the information economy a linchpin of corporate power, with monopoly profits on IP now constituting more or less the entire business model of Fortune 500 companies like General Electric, Pfizer, Microsoft, or Disney. These IP monopolists have insisted on the need for nearly unlimited government power extending to every corner of the globe to insulate their privileged assets from peaceful free market competition, and as a result of their legislative influence, typical copyright terms have doubled or quadrupled in length. Legal sanctions have only gotten harsher, 
and, to crown all, mandates for massive, internationally synchronized expansions in copyright and patent protections are now standard features embedded in neoliberal free trade agreements such as NAFTA, CAFTA, and Chorus FTA. 4. The Protectionist Monopoly Tucker identified the protectionist tariff as a monopoly in the sense that it artificially protected politically favored domestic producers from foreign competition. The tax on imports was explicitly intended to make goods more expensive for consumers when they came from the other side of a government border, thus allowing domestic producers to stay in business while selling their wares at higher prices and lower quality than they could in the face of unfettered competition. Besides protecting the bottom line of domestic capitalists, protectionist monopoly also inflicted artificially high costs of living on the working class due to the ratcheting up of the costs of consumer goods. Of the big four, the protectionist monopoly has seen the most reconfiguration and realignment since Tucker's day, with the rise of multinational corporations and political pressure in favor of neoliberal free trade agreements, the tariff has declined noticeably in political and economic importance since the 1880s. Footnote. These agreements do not actually represent free trade. They represent a shift in coercive trade barriers, not a reduction in them. While they reduce tariff rates in some industries, neoliberal free trade agreements typically include massive, coordinated increases in patent and copyright monopolies. They also are typically accompanied by the large-scale use of government-to-government loans, government land seizures, government-financed infrastructure development projects, and government-granted monopolies to privateering multinational corporations carried out through multi-government alliances such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. See Joe Peacott, Free Trade is Fair Trade, Chapter 29, pages 279 to 282 in this volume, Kevin Carson, Free Market Reforms and the Reduction of Statism, Chapter 28, pages 273 to 278 in this volume, and Charles Johnson, Two Words on Privatization, Chapter 30, pages 283 to 288 in this volume. See also Sean Wilbur, Whatever Happened to the Discourse on Neoliberalism, Two-Gun Mutualism and the Golden Rule, No Publisher, October 23, 2008. However, Tariffs remain a distorting force within limited domains. For example, the United States and European countries still maintain high tariffs on many imported agricultural goods. Moreover, the specific mechanism of import tariffs was much less important for Tucker's purposes than the overarching aim of protecting connected incumbents from foreign competition. In the 1880s, that meant the protectionist tariff. In the 2010s, it means a vast and complicated network of import tariffs on incoming foreign goods, export subsidies to outgoing domestic goods, the political manipulation of fiat currency exchange rates, and other methods for political control of the balance of international trade. As I've tried to indicate, Tucker's Big Four remain pervasive, and at least three of those four have in fact dramatically expanded their scope and invasiveness since Tucker originally described them. But besides the expansion and intensification of Tucker's Four, the past century has seen the proliferation and metastatic spread of government regulatory bodies intended to restructure markets and monitor and regiment economic transactions. If we were to try to make a similar list of all the major ways in which local, state, federal, and foreign governments now intervene to protect incumbent interests and place barriers to entry against potential competitors, there's no knowing how many monopolies we'd be dealing in, but I think that there are at least five new major monopolies, in addition to Tucker's original four, and a sixth structural factor, which are worthy of special notice for their pervasiveness and importance to the overall structure of the state-regulated economy. First, the agribusiness monopoly. Since the New Deal, an extensive system of government cartels, USDA regulatory burdens, subsidies to artificially increase prices for sale in American markets, more subsidies to artificially lower prices for export to foreign markets, surplus buy-up programs, irrigation projects, farm-to-market road-building projects, government technical support for more mechanized and capital-intensive forms of farming, along with many other similar measures, have all converged to ratchet up food prices for consumers, to make importing and exporting produce over tremendous distances artificially attractive, 
to distort agricultural production towards the vegetable and animal products that can most successfully attract subsidies and government support projects, to favor large-scale monocrop cultivation over smaller-scale farming, and generally to concentrate agriculture into factory farming and industrialized agribusiness. Footnote. In particular, the USDA's massive buy-up programs for school lunches and the military, which keep prices high and profoundly skew the agricultural markets by encouraging the overproduction of and providing a guaranteed captive market of last resort for low-grade meat, potatoes, dairy, and other factory-farmed commodity cash crops. Second, there is the security monopoly. Government has always exercised a monopoly on force within its territory, but since the 1880s, government has massively expanded the size of standing military forces, paramilitary police forces, and security and intelligence agencies. The past century has, thus, seen the creation of a gigantic industry full of monopsonistic rigged markets catering to the needs of government security forces and with a flourishing ecosystem of nominally private companies that subsist largely or entirely on tax-funded government contracts, contracts which, because they are tax-funded, are coercively financed by captive workers but controlled by government legislators and agencies. In addition to companies like Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Dyncorp, Blackwater, XE Services, and the rest of the military-industrial complex, the security monopoly also includes the growing number of companies such as Taser, footnote, manufacturer of widely used mobile electrical torture devices for government police forces, American Science and Engineering, footnote, manufacturer of widely used backscatter sexual assault devices for the Transportation Security Administration, or Wackenhut Geo Group, footnote, manufacturer of widely used, tax-funded, corporate-run prisons for several state governments, which cater primarily to government police forces and other homeland security agencies. War taxes, police taxes, or prison taxes represent a massive diversion of blood, sweat, tears, and toil from peaceful workers into a parallel, violent economy controlled by government contracts and politically connected corporations. Third, we must account for the infrastructure monopoly. That is, federal, state, or local government monopolization, tax subsidies, and allocation of access to transportation infrastructure. Government builds roads and rails and airports with extensive tax subsidies and resources allocated to government infrastructure on the basis of political pull. In addition, government cartelizes and heavily regulates local mass transit and long-distance travel with policies tightly restricting competition and entry into taxi, bus, rail, subway, shipping, and airline transportation. These subsidies to particular forms of long-distance transportation and long-haul freight shipping provide monopoly profits to the cartelized providers. They also provide a tax-supported business opportunity for agribusiness and big-box retailers like Walmart, whose business models are enabled by and dependent on government subsidies to road building and maintenance and the resulting artificially low costs of long-haul trucking. Fourth, there is the communications monopoly. Just as government control of transportation and physical infrastructure has benefited incumbent, centralized corporations in retail and distribution, incumbent telecommunications and media companies, from Viacom to AT&T to Comcast, have been able to build empires in part because access to broadband bandwidth has been restricted and politically allocated through the FCC, while access to cable, telephone, and fiber optic bandwidth has been tightly controlled and restricted through monopoly concessions on laying cable and fiber, which local governments have generally granted as a monopoly to one established company for each major transmission medium. Fifth, we might add regulatory protectionism. The proliferation of commercial regulations, government bureaucracy and red tape, business license fees, Byzantine tax codes, government-enforced professional licensure cartels and fees for everything from taxi driving to hair braiding to interior design, all of which cumulatively tend to benefit established businesses at the expense of new upstarts to protect those who can afford the fees and lawyers and accountants necessary to meet the requirements from competition by those who cannot, 
and generally to keep the poor out of entrepreneurial opportunities, independent professions, and more autonomous alternatives to conventional wage labor. In addition to these five new monopolies, we might also mention the structural effects of mass criminalization, incarceration, and deportation of socially or economically marginalized people. Activist libertarians have often condemned, on a moral or political level, the government's war on drugs or border apartheid or other government efforts to criminalize the poor and subject them to imprisonment for victimless crimes. As well they should. These government wars are nothing more than massive violence and cruelty directed against innocent people. But there has not yet been enough recognition of the structural, economic byproducts of government policies which confine, dispossess, terrorize, and stigmatize minorities, immigrants, and the poor generally. These policies lock one out of every three African American men in a cage, often for years at a time, take away years of their working life, expose their homes, cars, and money to police forfeiture proceedings, subject them to humiliating sub-minimum wage prison labor, often outsourced to politically connected corporations, and permanently stigmatize them as they try to re-enter the labor market and civil society. These policies constantly threaten undocumented immigrants with the threat of arrest, imprisonment, and exile from their homes and livelihoods, cutting them off from nearly all opportunities outside of immediate cash wages and exhausting under-the-table manual labor, locking away opportunities for education behind proof-of-residency requirements, and putting them constantly at the mercy of bosses, co-workers, landlords, and neighbors who can threaten to turn them in and have them deported for retaliation, leverage, or simply for the sake of employee turnover. Such a massive system of government violence, dispossession, and constraint on livelihoods is sure to have massive impacts on the conditions under which many poor and legally vulnerable people enter into labor markets, housing markets, and all other areas of economic life. What about them poor old bosses? What about gains from trade and economies of scale? I've spent a fair amount of time discussing the general thesis that the cash nexus is artificially expanded and forcibly deformed into the patterns of actually existing capitalism by means of government privilege to big players, and discussing the many monopolies, once the big four, now the big ten at least, that provide some of the most pervasive and intense points of force that dispossess working people, favor big centralized forms of business, and coercively favor capitalistic, formalized, commercialized uses of resources over non-commercialized alternatives. Footnote. For more on the last point, see Charles Johnson, Three Notes for the Critics of the Critics of Apologists for Walmart. Radgeek People's Daily. No Publisher. April 25, 2009. One of the objections which may have occurred to you by now is that government intervention in the economy goes in more than one direction. It may be true that the monopolies Tucker and I have named tend to benefit entrenched players and conventionally capitalistic arrangements. But what about government regulations that benefit poor people, such as government welfare schemes, small players, such as, say, small business administration loans, or which are supposed to regulate and control the business practices of large-scale, concentrated forms of enterprise, such as health and safety regulations or antitrust legislation? First, this kind of response seems to suggest an unjustified faith in the efficacy of government regulation and welfare state programs to achieve their stated ends. In fact, as I've already suggested, much of the progressive regulatory structure supposedly aimed at curbing big business has mainly served to cartelize big business and to create large fixed costs which tend to drive out potential competitors from the rigged markets in which they have entrenched themselves. Historical work by Gabriel Kolko and Butler Schaefer has, I think, convincingly shown that these regulatory measures mainly served to rigidify the positions of existing market incumbents and to bail out failing cartelists so as to prevent freedom from disrupting a well-regulated market. Footnote. Gabriel Kolko, The Triumph of Conservatism, A Reinterpretation of American History. 1900 to 1916, New York, Free, 1963. Footnote, Butler Schaefer, In Restraint of Trade, The Business Campaign Against Competition, 1918 to 1938. 
Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, Bucknell University Press, 1997. Nor was this generally an accident. These measures were, most often, passed at the behest of the incumbent companies, which hoped to see their competitors squashed by the compliance costs. There are good a priori reasons, from the public choice analysis of the incentives faced by politically appointed regulators, to believe that such regulatory efforts will always be highly prone to capture by the concentrated interests of market incumbents to be wielded against the dispersed interests of consumers, workers, and would-be startup competitors. Second, it is important to keep in mind questions of priority and scale. While I object to SBA loans, OSHA, antitrust legislation, social welfare programs, and other government interventions as much as any other free marketeer, I think that in this age of trillion-dollar bank bailouts, it ought to be clear that, even if government is putting its finger on both sides of the scale, one finger is pushing down a lot harder than the other. Footnote. A few years back, I received a $600 check from the United States Department of the Treasury during the tax rebate program, supposedly for the sake of economic recovery. At about the same time, AIG received an $85 billion check from the United States Department of the Treasury, also supposedly for the sake of economic recovery. But it would strain credulity to say that this means that bailout capitalism is subsidizing the little guy just like how it subsidizes entrenched corporate players. You may also be concerned that I have had so little to say so far about some of the conventional explanations that free market economists have offered for the efficiency and scalability of capitalistic arrangements. Arrangements based, for example, on the division of labor or on economies of scale or gains from trade. But I am not denying the value of either the division of labor or gains from trade. I am suggesting that labor and trade might be organized along different lines than they are currently organized, in alternative forms of specialization and trade such as co-ops, worker-managed firms, or independent contracting, with comparatively less centralization of decision-making, less hierarchy, less management, and in many cases, more trade and entrepreneurial independence among the workers involved. Centralized, capitalistic forms of organization are only one sort of cash nexus among many others, and the cash nexus itself is only one way of facilitating a division of labor and a mutually beneficial exchange to take place. Returning to the broader sense of markets as a space of social experimentation, there are all kinds of other social experiments, not necessarily based on quid pro quo exchanges or on cash media, that provide places for people to meet, work, and swap. If the Big Ten and the many monopolies prove anything, it is that there are numerous areas of life in which people are not choosing to divide their labor or make trades through the medium of corporate commerce. There are many areas of life where they would rather not be spending much or any money at all, but are shoved into doing so, and shoved into doing so with a boss, landlord, or faceless corporation, when a freed market would allow them to divide their labor in other ways, trade for other things, or trade for what they need by means other than an invoice and cash on the barrelhead. It is also common to point to economies of scale as an economic reason for believing that large, centralized corporations, industrial agribusiness, etc., would survive even without the government subsidies and monopolies they currently enjoy, so long as they had a market arena to compete in. But while I'd hardly deny the importance of economies of scale, I think it is important to remember that economies of scale represent a trade-off between gains and losses. There are diseconomies of scale, just as there are economies of scale. As scale increases, so do the costs of communication and management within the larger workforce, the costs of maintaining heavier equipment, the difficulty of accounting and efficiently allocating resources as more transactions are internalized within the firm, and the difficulty of regearing such a large mechanism to respond to new challenges from new competitors and changing market conditions. Footnote. For a detailed discussion of the diseconomies of scale, see Kevin A. Carson, Economic Calculation in the Corporate Commonwealth, Chapter 22, pages 213 to 222 in this volume. The question is not whether or not there are economies of scale. There are, and there is also a point at which the economies of scale are outweighed by the diseconomies. The question is where that point is, and whether, in a free market, the equilibrium point would tend to shift towards smaller scales or towards larger scales. When government monopolies and rigged markets artificially encourage large, consolidated, bureaucratic forms of organization, 
Organizations which can better afford the high fixed costs imposed by regulatory requirements can better lobby for subsidies, can better capture regulatory bodies and use them to advance their own interests, etc. That shifts the balance by forcing up the rewards of scale. When the same measures punish small competitors in favor of market incumbents, and especially when it punishes informal, small-scale community or personal uses of scarce resources in favor of formalized commercial uses, government forcibly pushes the diseconomies of scale down by suppressing competitors who might eat the eggs of the political economic dinosaurs. In both cases, the most pervasive and far-reaching forms of government economic intervention tend to deform economic life towards formalization, commercialization, consolidation, hyperthyroidal scale, and the complex hierarchy that's needed to manage it. Not because these things are naturally demanded by economies of scale, but rather because they grow out of control when the costs of scale are socialized and the competitive pressures and alternatives burned out by government monopoly. Is this all just a semantic debate? When market anarchists come out for free markets but against capitalism, when they suggest that it's important not to use the term capitalism to describe the system that we are for and fit out their position with the rhetoric and social identity of the radical left, conventionally pro-capitalist libertarians often charge that the market anarchists are just playing with words or trying to change the vocabulary of our sick message in a misguided ploy to appeal to people who do not share our sick economic views. Footnote, Jackson Reeves, Letter to Walter Block, quoted Walter Block and Jackson Reeves, Capitalism Yesterday, Capitalism Today, Capitalism Tomorrow, Capitalism Forever. LewRockwell.com, Center for Libertarian Studies, March 26, 2010. Available at lewrockwell.com. The letter was in response to some recent anti-capitalist statements aired by Sheldon Richman. There is not much to say to that, except to ask just who wrote this message we are supposed to be sharing with the economic right, and to point out that the use of capitalism, in any case, really is more complicated than that. There are several meanings attached to the word which have coexisted historically. Those meanings are often conflated and confused with each other and Capitalism I, the peculiar technical use of the term by pro-capitalist libertarians to refer strictly to free markets, free markets in the very broadest sense, markets as spaces of unbounded social experimentation, is only one historical use among many, neither the original use nor the use that's most common today. Footnote. Capitalism, or Kapitalism, first appears as a term used to describe a political economy system of production in French radical literature of the mid-19th century. Prior to that, the term was simply used to refer to the line of work that capitalists were in, that is, making money by lending money at interest, by investing in other people's businesses, or by personally owning capital and hiring labor to work it. The original uses of the term had nothing in particular to do with free markets and the factors of production. Louis Blanc, in Organisation du Travail, defined capitalism as the appropriation of capital by some to the exclusion of others, and when Proudhon, who was in favor of free markets, wrote of capitalism in La Guerre et la Paix, he defined it as an economic and social regime in which capital, the source of income, does not generally belong to those who make it work through their labor. Depending on the details of what one means by appropriation and exclusion, Blanc's usage may refer to Capitalism II or Capitalism III. Proudhon's definition is clearly a reference to Capitalism III. Footnote. Michael Moore's recent film, Capitalism, A Love Story, is not about free markets. It's about the bailouts. Free market anti-capitalists aren't trying to change anything. We are using the word capitalism in a perfectly traditional and reasonable sense, straight out of ordinary language, when we use it to describe the political privileges we're against, capitalism too, and the nasty structural consequences of those privileges, capitalism three. To be sure, equivocal uses and conflation of terms is a bad thing. It's important to distinguish the different meanings of capitalism to be clear on what we mean, and to get clear on what our interlocutors mean when we use the term. But once you've done the distinguishing, is it worth spending any great effort on arguing about the label capitalism rather than just breaking out the subscripts where necessary and moving on?
If the argument about capitalism has helped draw out some of the economic and historical points that I've been concentrating on in these remarks, then that may be of some genuine use to libertarian dialogue. But once those points are drawn out, aren't they the important thing, not the terminological dispute? And aren't they something that nominally pro-capitalist libertarians would also immediately object to if asked? All libertarians, even nominally pro-capitalist libertarians, oppose corporate welfare, government monopolies, regulatory cartels, and markets rigged in favor of big business. So why worry so much about the terminology? I certainly sympathize with the impulse, if I had to choose between debates about the word capitalism and debates over the state corporatist interventions I've been discussing, I think the latter is always going to be a lot more important. When we try to understand what other people say about markets or capitalism, considerations of charity absolutely call for this kind of approach. When a libertarian writer praises capitalism, meaning freed markets, or when a libertarian writer condemns capitalism, meaning corporatist privilege or boss economies, then the best thing to do is just take them on their own terms and interpret their argument accordingly. But there's a lot to argue about here that's not just labels, and it's not always clear that that's something we all readily agree on. What about when it's not clear that the writer has really consistently held on to the distinction between free markets and actually existing capitalism? Footnote. For examples, see the critical discussion in Roderick Long, Corporations vs. the Market, or Whip Conflation Now, Chapter 20, pages 201-210 to 210 in this volume. Kevin Carson, Vulgar Libertarianism, Neoliberalism, and Corporate Welfare, a Compendium of Posts, Mutualist Blog, Free Market Anticapitalism, No Publisher, September 9, 2006. Charles Johnson, El Pueblo Unido Jamás Será Vencido, Radgeek People's Daily, No Publisher, March 23, 2005, etc. What about when we're not just talking about single positions on isolated policy proposals, but talking about the bigger picture of how it all works, not just the individual pieces, but the gestalt picture that they form when fitted together? When, that is, it really starts to matter not only how a writer would answer a list of questions if asked, but also which questions she thinks to ask in the first place, which features of the situation immediately come to mind for analysis and criticism, and which features are kept left as afterthoughts. This raises the question of paradigm cases, of what sorts of examples we take as typical or characteristic, or especially illustrative, of what freed markets would be and how they would work. When we are looking at the broader picture, at how political and economic structures play off of each other, we're talking about a structure that has a foreground and a background, more important and less important features. And one of the important questions is not just what may be encompassed by the verbal definitions given for our terminology, but also what sorts of paradigm cases for markets and voluntary society the terminology might suggest, and whether the cases it suggests really are good paradigm cases, whether they reveal something important about free societies, or whether they conceal or obscure it. Identifying a free market position with capitalism, even if you are absolutely clear that you just mean capitalism one, theoretically including all kinds of market exchange and voluntary social experimentation outside the cash nexus, offers a particular picture of what's important about and characteristic of a free society, and that picture tends to obscure a lot more than it reveals. When we picture freed market activity, what does it look like? Is our model something that looks a lot like business as usual, with a few changes here and there around the edges? Or something radically different, or radically beyond anything that currently prevails in this rigidified, monopolized market? Do we conceive of and explain markets on the model of a commercial strip mall, sanitized, centralized, regimented, officious, and dominated by a few powerful proprietors and their short list of favored partners to whom everyone else relates as either an employee or a consumer? Or do we instead look at the revolutionary potential of truly free markets to make things messy? How markets without the pervasive control of state licensure requirements, regulation, inspections, paperwork, taxes, fees, and the rest so often look more like a traditional image of a bazaar, decentralized, diverse, informal, flexible, pervaded by haggling, 
a gathering for social intercourse just as much as stereotypical commerce, and all of it kept together by the spontaneous order of countless small-time independent operators who quickly and easily shift between the roles of customer, merchant, leisure seeker, independent laborer, and more besides. Footnote. The images of the strip mall and the bazaar are taken from my concluding paragraph in Scratching By. Those images were inspired by and modified from Eric Raymond's use of the cathedral and the bazaar to explain and defend hacker culture and open-source software. When markets are associated with a term like capitalism, which is historically so closely attached to workplace hierarchy and big business, and a term which is so linguistically connected with the business of professional capitalists, that is, people in the business of renting out accumulated capital, this naturally influences the kind of examples that come to mind, fetishizing the business of professionalized capitalists at the expense of more informal and simply non-commercial forms of ownership, experimentation, and exchange. It tends to rig the understanding of markets toward an exclusive focus on the cash nexus, and it tends to rig the understanding of the cash nexus toward an exclusive focus on the most comfortably capitalistic, hierarchical, centralized, formalized, and business-like sorts of enterprises, as if these were so many features of the natural landscape in a market rather than the visible results of concerted government force. Freeing the freed market from the banner of capitalism, on the other hand, and identifying markets with the opposition to mercantile privilege, to the expropriation of labor, and to the resulting concentrations of wealth in the hands of a select class, brings a whole new set of considerations and examples into the foreground. These new paradigm cases for free markets are deeply important if they encourage a wider and richer conception of what's in a market, a conception which doesn't just rhetorically include mutualistic alternatives and social experimentation outside the cash nexus as some sort of bare possibility or marginal phenomenon, but actually encourages us to envision markets pervaded by these forms of free association and exchange, to see how non-capitalist and non-commercial experimentation might take on a prominent, even explosive role in an economy freed from the rigged markets and many monopolies of state-supported corporate capitalism. The free market anti-capitalist holds that it's precisely because of those rigged markets that we have the strip mall rather than the bazaar, and precisely because we have the strip mall rather than the bazaar, that so many working-class folks find themselves on the skids, trapped in precarious arrangements at the mercy of bosses, landlords, bill collectors, and insurance adjusters, reeling from sky-high medical bills or endless rent and debt, confronted by faceless corporations, hyper-commercialized society, and a cold, desperate struggle to scrape by in a highly rigidified capitalist's market. Since this cruel predicament is so central to how most people experience the market in everyday life, it's vital for market anarchists to clearly mark out the different positive, disruptive possibilities markets offer for a liberated civil society. The social problem is not the fact of market exchange, but rather the deformation of market exchange by hierarchy and political privilege. We must show what commerce might look like without capitalism, and what markets might look like when commercial dealings are only one kind of dealing among many, chosen where they are the most positive and pleasant way to take care of things, not where they are foisted on us by grim necessity. Our words must be revolutionary words, and our banners must not be banners that bury radical alternatives under conservatism and privilege. They must be banners that honestly and bravely hold out the promise of radical social and economic transformation.